So welcome to our quarterly Liberty Update session. My name is Lars Bethmann and I'm part of the Mayor team for application modernization. Today we will talk about Liberty 22004, 5 and 6. As always, the session will be recorded. First, we will talk about the latest Liberty enhancement and updates. Then we will have some uh, time to answer all your questions. So please use the Q&A session during the session to ask your questions. Today, we have two speakers, Alistair Nottingham, who is a Liberty Runtime Architect, and Ada Dmitri, who is the Development Lead for the Liberty Operator. So without further introduction, I will now hand over to Alistair. Alistair, the stage is yours. Hi, thank you, uh, Lars. And um, as as usual, we, we kind of have a brief agenda. Um, I, I, I was just updating the charts uh, earlier because uh, unfortunately one or two of the, the people who were in the first run are on vacation this week. So I was updating it to kind of correct who was going to say what, what and I, I, I missed the fact that Graham uh, is on vacation and I'm doing the part one because historically I did part one. Apparently I also missed the fact that I have two part twos. But the general agenda is uh, I'll, I'll do the kind of liberty um, overview. Um, uh, then, I, then I'm going to get um, Arthur to talk about the, the new Web for Liberty operator, which is uh, something we have just delivered uh, for deploying and managing uh, Liberty inside of uh, a Kubernetes or an OpenShift environment. And uh, I, uh, he'll be doing some demos of that capability. Um, and then, uh, you know, towards the end, we'll be talking about what's new in the quarter other than the Web to Liberty operator. So the Web to Liberty operator is kind of the big, the big thing uh, that we've delivered, but we'll, and we'll, but we'll talk about some of the other kind of uh, improvements that we've also added. And then as always at the end, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A as uh, Lars said, if you just kind of drop it into the, the chat, um, we will uh, attempt to uh, respond at, at the end. Um, so um, onto the the, 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 the the eponymous 30 minute overview. Um, so when we look at um, where the kind of industry has evolved since the um, introduction of kind of WebSphere and the whole idea of enterprise Java, um, there's there's been a significant um, uh, change um, f uh, in 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 the kind of environment that most of these applications operate in. So you know, back when we started with WebSphere, um, you know, the development methodology was mainly waterfall. Um, uh, uh, Agile has been, you know, around for so long that, you know, I kind of don't really feel like I have a good memory of when we were waterfall, but we were absolutely waterfall um, when I started uh, my career. Um, and also the infrastructure has significantly changed because, you know, back then, um, hardware was effectively constrained by how much you physically had in your data center you need people wanted to ensure that they could get uh the best usage of the hardware they had because getting hardware would take quite a bit of time um over the years and you know especially with the growth of um uh, cl public cloud providers uh, a lot of those constraints have been uh reduced so instead of you know, people doing kind of waterfall with multi-year development cycles, everything is much more agile and people want to be able to quickly respond to uh, the changing competitive environment with their technology. Um, and also at the same time, um, infrastructure through kind of public clouds has effectively been significantly cheaper to uh, provision and um, bring online. If you want to uh, spin up a, 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 a new server because let's say your workload is higher, you know, that can be done in, in, in minutes or hours compared, you know, well, seconds or minutes rather than the days or weeks that it would have done when you were talking about bringing physical hardware into an existing data center. And, you know, with those changes, um, you know, that's where containerization uh, um, come, and come, come, starts to come in. And it's where uh, people are increasingly looking at, you know, how do you build applications that really can take advantage of these um, environments whilst also having a lot of applications that, that were 
kind of originally created in this very different environment. And when we looked at kind of uh, traditional application servers of which WebSphere traditional is one, um, you know, they were based built around the idea that you would kind of stand up a server and it would stand there and it would it would run for a long period of time. You know, your server you'd expect to run for you know weeks, uh, if not months, between um, making uh, changes, and that's just not how these newer environments uh, work, you tend to want to be able to push updates out much more quickly. Um, if there's a problem in your application, restarting the server is uh, generally speaking, you know, what you want that to be quick, um, especially within a Kubernetes kind of environment. The the idea is you, you know, you, you have an issue, you dispose of your pod and a new server is brought up. And those traditional application servers um, struggle with that that transition and uh, 10 years ago um, this month uh, we introduced uh, Liberty and although you know containerization wasn't a thing then we were looking at the kind of trends that have led up to where we are today and realized that what we would need for a future runtime is something very different and that's where we started building Liberty and then created Open Liberty um to kind of respond to those those needs so whilst you can run liberty in the same you know in a traditional environment where you start your server and you expect it to run for long periods of time uh because of liberty's memory um startup time um ease of use um the way we designed it to work well with configuration as code environments uh, for automated deployments means liberty fits much better within this kind of new environment so, um, you know, if we look at kind of the the, the ecosystem of WebSphere and um, our kind of what people's needs are from kind of traditional WebSphere and Liberty, um, we we see you know the kind of what people need from the traditional runtime is really uh, they need to be able to continue to run it, but they want stability. The, People don't want to take those applications and have to do significant change to them just in order to keep current with the latest uh, TLS specifications, the latest encryption standards, uh, to keep running it on the most recent operating systems or with the, the most recent databases. So the, 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 the API set um, is, is stability is, is needed, um, but the that the also whilst maintaining kind of the ability to connect to the existing infrastructure around it. Whereas um, when we look at kind of Liberty, what people are looking for is, um, you know, to know that they've got something that is a suitable cloud native runtime that works weight in containers. Um, it's very lightweight, very efficient, and, and it enables and, and promotes the, the, the most recent technology stacks that they can make use of. So in terms of kind of traditional web server versus Liberty, when you look at the capabilities we bring to those environments, um, this is kind of part of our, our guiding rationale. Um, so um, if we look at the, 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 the kind of product mix that people, um, that, that our kind of our, our web server organization um, has, uh, it has changed over the years. Um, so a lot of people will be used to, you know, using the WebSphere ND product. Um, there's a, we have a new um, product. Um, I think it was introduced. I, I feel like the pandemic uh, has made each year blur into a one. Um, but we have this relatively new product called WebSphere Hybrid Edition. And what WebSphere Hybrid Edition does is it um, brings together um via ratio table entitlement to all of the webster editions um except zios um so if you buy um entitlement to hybrid edition you can use a certain amount ratio you know you can if you buy say one uh one core of hybrid edition you can use uh one core of nd or four cores of uh base or eight cores of nd with no need to kind of talk to sales to purchase additional products and that gives you the kind of flexibility um, to make the decision about what edition you want to run in. And this is quite useful because we have some customers who 
are going from a, a, a Webster MD to a Liberty on Containers approach. And as you transition to Liberty on Containers, a base license is much more appropriate than a, an ND one. And within the construct of hybrid edition, um, you can make that change without needing to talk to a, an IBM sales representative because your kind of hybrid edition entitlement uh, entitles you to do that. In addition to the kind of Web Street traditional Liberty runtimes, Hybrid Edition also includes a whole suite of tools um, for doing migration. So you've got Transformation Advisor, um, which is allows you to kind of helps you with that modernization from traditional to Liberty, um, including with containerization. Um, and also, and there's also a tool called Monitor Micro, which will help you to kind of analyze if you're wanting to take a monolith and turn it into a microservice architecture. A lot of people are you don't have a good understanding of <clears throat> um, how best to do that. And what Mono to Micro does is it instruments the application, it instruments the application so an analysis can be done, and then the analysis can make suggestions on how to break the application up into uh, microservices. And then a relatively new product that we've <clears throat> we uh, introduced uh, uh, last year is Webster Automation. And the, the goal of Webster Automation is really to um, provide uh, enhanced kind of automation and understanding of your uh, WebSphere um, deployment. So uh, one of the key uh, first key capabilities that we delivered through Webster Automation was it was able to uh, understand what um, uh, security bulletins have been issued for WebSphere and tell you where your infrastructure did or did not have the fixes for those security bulletins applied. So if a security bulletin was kind of issued on a Sunday, you would come in on a Monday morning, you'd get an email and you'd be able to kind of lock in and it would tell you here are all the servers that are affected by that security bulletin um, so you can go and patch them. And what we've just done in the most recent release, which I think was GA yesterday, is um, we have um, augmented that capability so it's not just able to um, tell you that there is a problem. It also provides support for you to, you know, to manage the installation of those security fixes. So when you log into that view that says these servers have kind of uh, vulnerabilities, uh, you can select to install an update and it will tell you the scope of um, what that update means because you don't update servers, you update the install that's associated with the server and there could be multiple servers that are affected by that. But it, um, it really kind of helps to simplify um, some of those automation operations. And I've just given an outline of one of the, uh, one of the key um, capabilities there. So we... Um, you know, we are, have uh, a, a long time, you know, I've been talking here, I think, uh, when we did the last one, um, uh, Tom, Tom McManus, who is one of, who's been involved in the, uh, this, these calls, these, these webcasts for uh, many years, um, said that this is, the, this, it was the 36th, so this is the 37th time I've been in front of you talking about the value of liberty in a quarterly update. And, um, it's it's all it's all nice uh, that I can go and say how awesome we are, but um, I'm hardly an unbiased observer. So uh, what IBM did um, and, and has done in the past as well is we we hired a company to um, do a study it, based on interviews with uh, customers, people who really used um, and are using Liberty and have made the transition from traditional application service to Liberty to get an understanding of what the benefits they actually received were. And all that, you know, this was funded by IBM. It was kind of independently, um, uh, it was an independent uh, process uh, interviewing uh, real customers about their usage. And what, what it, it came up with uh, afterwards was that um, switching from a traditional uh, runtime to Liberty resulted in a, a, a significant increase in developer productivity. Um, some of the, the things that uh, add to that are, are kind of very rapid, um, what's these days called in a loop, but rapid code um, 
run debug cycles. Um, and also a lot of the, the support that we have for moving that into kin, in containers very easily. Um, on top of that was a 40% increase in IT um, admin productivity, um, which, um, you know, certainly the, 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 the way uh, you can easily automate and script Liberty um, is a significant part of that. And um, they found that they had 195% return on their investment in moving to Liberty within an eight month payback period. So, you know, if you're running on uh, a, a non-Liberty uh, runtime and you decide you want to um, make the switch, um, the, the customers that the TI study was based on uh, had the, the return on investment paid back uh, within a year, which is always uh, good to, to know. Um, so the way that we have built Liberty to achieve this, uh, these kind of gains and improvements was we decided that um, traditional application servers were essentially big kind of monolithic things where you had to take everything, even if you didn't use and need everything. Um, and over the years, more and more things had been put into the kind of the, the application server space. So everything had got larger and larger, despite the fact that applications, and I'm sorry, my cat does not know I'm on a webcast. Um, uh, that, that wrecked my flow. Um, okay, so it, 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 you would have to have um, the, um, you'd have all of these capability and you wouldn't necessarily use it. So when we designed Liberty, we decided to take a different approach and we decided to deconstruct um, the capability of Liberty into a, a series of uh, features where the features are defined to be granular enough to provide some meaningful uh, amount of function. And then um, we created a kernel that would be able to orchestrate, reconfigure a simplified configuration format, certainly simplified versus many other application runtimes, um, and orchestrate and start the server based on, on these features. So for example, if you if you decide you want the JAXA RS 2.1 capability and that's it, you can configure it in the server XML. And we know all of the things that uh, JAXA RS 2.1 needs. So we're able to run, um, install everything it needs into the, the server. Um, this means that you can get uh, a runtime that does exactly what you need and no more. And that gives you a uh, better startup time. It gives you better uh, throughput because although we endeavor to make everything run as quickly and easily and as low a cost as possible, um, nothing beats not running code. Um, nothing is as fast as not running code that doesn't need to run. And, uh, you know, within Liberty, um, uh, almost uh, most of the benefits that uh, we talk about with Liberty stem from this feature architecture. So uh, we talk about zero migration um, and the fact that you know Liberty supports uh, you know multiple versions of a API features. So if you're using Java E7 and you want to move up to the latest fixed pack of Liberty, you can do that without your application breaking. Even though Liberty currently supports uh, Java E8 uh, and Jakarta E9. Um, and those are much, much newer. So you can keep current, you can keep on the latest version of the APIs without having to do an application uh, migration just to, to stay current. Um, when, we, when, when, when we talk about the kind of this, these responsibility, uh, the, the, how the environment has changed for application development, um, in the traditional kind of environments where um, webs are traditional or excels, um, what would typically happen is your application team would be responsible for the application, they'd develop the application, and they'd hand it over to an operations team with a bunch of instructions on how, how it needs to run. And then the, the infrastructure team is responsible for running the application, keeping the servers up to date, um, keeping the running if, if they need to do a, a, a a, a fixed pack install, it's the infrastructure team that's worrying about how to manage and, and roll that out. Um, as things move towards more of a containerized world, a lot of that responsibility shifts to the uh, shifts. And what the infrastructure team manages, the container platform. 
um, and what the developer manages is now um, everything inside of the um, uh, inside of the container, which includes uh, at some level the operating system, um, uh, Java version, server versions, as well as all of the application stuff, and that that shifts the burden significantly onto the developer. And this is why with Liberty, we switched to doing a release every um, four weeks, um, including updating um, images that we make available in the IBM container registry. So if an application developer um, depends on the images that we provide, um, we're doing updates um, every, you know, we're doing uh, new releases every four weeks. So if there is a, uh, security fix or a bug that they need, um, it, it can be just as simple as having to real build uh, the application container to pick up the most recent version um, of the container. Um, if we didn't do that, if the developer decides they want to build their own containers and the entire stack, then they need to worry about making sure that Java and the server um, and the operating system is, is all kept up to date for any uh, vulnerabilities, which is a significant uh, uh, amount of extra work on on, on the developer. So, um, we when we look at kind of performance um, for Liberty, um, we run a whole bunch of different benchmarks um, for Liberty, running across a whole bunch of different um, things, and our goal is is always uh, on focused on making sure that. You know, startup time, memory footprint, and throughput are all industry leading. And um, you know, when we kind of, you know, not all not all benchmarks run on all platforms. So this is kind of an amalgamation of uh, various different data sets um, in order to get this. But if we that this exact view, so if you look at any one of them, there might be slightly different um, uh, results. But what we generally see is that if you run um, uh, an application workload on Liberty, it uses a significant amount less memory and a, you get significantly better throughput. So in this case, all of the bars are lower is better. So we've effectively scaled the throughput. So uh, number two uh, went two on throughput means half the throughput of a one. And uh, you'll notice that you know if you compare uh, Liberty with uh, say Spring Boot on the right, um, you're getting um, half, half. Uh, uh, Spring Boot gives half the um, the throughput for the application and requires twice the memory. Um, if you look, compare it with say JBoss, which is a bit more of an apples to apples comparison, uh, there's a significant amount less memory and the throughput is um, is is better by. It's, I I can never switch this one round, I think it's 30 or 40% um, it works out as. And what that means is that, you know, for the, the compute resources, for the memory you need, you need fewer instances to run the same uh, workload. So, um, uh, you know, this just shows that we are still focusing on still ensuring that Liberty um, as a runtime is going to be the best choice for applications. Um, and I, I've, I've put this chart in, I'm, although it says Kubernetes optimized, I'm not going to talk hugely about um, the Kubernetes side of this. Um, I do want to talk about the kind of picture, um, the graph. Um, the part of the reason why our, our throughput is so good is because we have this thread pool, which is automatically tunes itself to get the optimal amount of throughput. And um, we we kind of run some tests and we've we've done calculations and we've done some tests based on you know how much work an individual request is attempting to drive through the system and you know the way we do this is by inserting a, a delay um, into the request to simulate um, actual work going going on and you can see from this that the the thread pool scales up. Um, very quickly to um, a high level um, of, of throughput. And this is all automatic. So in the old days, you would need to run some performance metrics and you'd need to work out for yourself what the optimal amount of um, load is. And uh, we do that for you automatically. And the other advantage of doing it automatically based on the resources available is um, in these kind of 
more cloud-oriented environments, how much um, compute capacity is available to you is a lot more variable than it was when you're running on a um, physical machine or when you're running in a virtualized environment. Um, so we can tune for the environment the application is running in as opposed to the kind of ideal view of what should be available to that application. Um, I touched on this kind of uh, earlier. This uh, slide is really talking about comparing the programming model uh, available with Liberty versus some other runtimes. And the key thing here, for me at least, is um, you'll see that uh, uh, Liberty supports Java re, so a subset of Java 6, Java 7, 8, and Jakarta 9. Um, but if you were to go and look at the competition, they're either implementing a subset of those APIs, or um, there it's it's you know uh, a subset of like Java EE eight or a subset of Java EE nine, Jakarta EE nine, or they implement one version. Um, so that means that, for example, if you decide to go with uh, if you're using JWC AP and you're on uh, a version six which implements Java EE seven, um, and that goes out of support, uh, in order to move to JBLC AP 7.4, you have to recode your application to um, and migrate it to Java EE 8, along with doing a runtime migration. Um, with Liberty, because of zero migration, you don't have to do any of that. You just upgrade your Liberty to the new version, and your application and the configuration continues to work as, as before. And with that, I'd like to pass over to um, Artur to go into the Web Liberty operator. So um, thank you, over to you, Artur. Hello. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Um, so I'm going to be starting with a small presentation, and then I'll be doing the demo. Um, so let me share my screen. Great. Um, so, uh, so what is WebSphere Liberty Operator? And um, if you are not familiar with operators, I will sh um, discuss that as well. So it's a recent. Uh, release that we made uh, on June 9th, uh, just about three weeks ago. And uh, it's available from IBM Operator Catalog, which is um, a repository for um, operators that you can add into your OpenShift uh, cluster or other Kubernetes environments if you're running Operators Lifecycle Manager. It's a tool that installs operators um, in Kubernetes environments. There's also a link to a release blog. And uh, we have a documentation that is um, describing how to use it, how to install it um, in more detail. Um, so what is really operators? Um, so operator is a, a tool that is written usually in some uh, actual language, like Go, Java, or others, and can have logic that extends Kubernetes cluster. It provides its own APIs called uh, customer source definitions, or CRDs. Um, it's uh, new APIs similar to deployment stateful set and others that Kubernetes uh, have out of the box, but they'll let you uh, create your own YAML uh, schemas and definitions and uh, each operator provides its own set of APIs. Um, so when running operator in the cluster, and what that's what it does, you have to install it and it runs within the cluster, it uh, is able to see the state of the cluster, receive Kubernetes events, updates to the uh, different objects, your deployments, your um, resources, and anything within the cluster and take action and respond to that. So general flow is that user creates uh, one of the APIs and then uh, operator will take that as an input and uh, decide what to do with it and create or update the state of your application's deployment. And compared to other um, deployment mechanisms such as Helm charts, uh, cube control apply, or similar like um, simple uh, 
deployment mechanism. So you uh, have logic inside operators that is more uh, capable. It can check the health of the application and restore it back to the original state if something goes wrong. It uh, also can report errors back to the uh, user much more efficiently and more clearly than uh, things like Helm chart, where it's you just deploy it once and that's it. And, the, um, and, and if something goes wrong, it's uh, hard there to debug. So um, when uh, you deploy something without an operator, you have to manage a lot of different resources. Um, Kubernetes has um, many, many APIs, and it's a pretty hard uh, to learn them all. Um, at, at first glance, you have to understand uh, all the pieces of the application's deployment on the Kubernetes environment. Um, and operator simplifies that into a much smarter way of deploying it. So also, if you have uh, many different applications, each application has to manage uh, deployments, other resources, and it's hard to keep it consistent across your many applications and within your organization. Um, so operator simplifies that and makes it uh, easier to follow good practices. So you, uh, you can be sure that this will be um, enforce the like your settings will be enforced for all applications if you follow operators deployment pattern and um, also it provides uh, day two operations so uh, those are things that uh, you can do after you deploy your application so once it's running you might want to do something uh, to your application and because operator is running within a cluster uh, it's capable of accessing uh, your application, your deployment, and so on. So when uh, running with WebSphere Liberty operator, we provide uh, an API called WebSphere Liberty application. And it's uh, something similar to what we have in Open Liberty operator. If you ever use that, it's very, very similar, but it uh, adds new functionalities such as license tracking um, and others as well. We added new features that I'll show and demonstrate later on in a demo. And most of the configuration for your deployments goes through this Web Server Liberty application um, uh, uh, API or CRD. Um, so where does operator fits within your deployment and um, how to use it. Essentially, the first thing you do is you deploy or you build your application. So you go through your pipeline, building either source to image or doing Docker or uh, container builds, and you will uh, be uh, you'll end up with a image that you can deploy to Kubernetes environment. And once you do have that. Uh, you will create a WebServer Liberty application CR, and it, uh, from that point on, it takes care of creating all the necessary resources for application to run within Kubernetes. And uh, here's a list of some features that we have in uh, WebServer Liberty operator. Uh, I'll talk about some of them uh, in a demo. The main ones are the license service, certificate management integration, uh, and uh, some uh, network uh, policy constraints that we improved in the new version and so on. And um, there's plenty more features that you can use and uh, including like readiness and loudness probes that can, check the state of your application, react to it, and uh, restart your server if it's not healthy, if it's deadlocked or something like that happened. Uh, it can uh, scale your application automatically and so on. Um, so now let's go to the demo. Um, 
So operators come from uh, Operator Hub. It's uh, similar to application store. Um, you can have uh, many catalogs and from uh, there is a catalog for official Red Hat catalogs. IBM provides its own. So I'm gonna choose IBM operator catalog as a source. So there's different operators that you can install from there. So uh, you can search for Web Server Liberty operator and as I see, it's already installed on my cluster. Um, and there is some documentation here um, on what it provides and what capabilities it has and how to install it as well. And once you, it is installed, it will show up in installed operators and um, it will uh, be managing certain namespace. So what operator does when you install it or uh, operator hub does when you install the operator, it makes sure that operator has access only to namespaces and projects that you selected and um, operators come with RBAC, uh, which means that operator only has access to resources that you really need um, access to. So it will not be able to act on other resources that it's not supposed to. And you can install it either in a single namespace that uh, uh, like I did, it's managing a single a WLO demo namespace, uh, or you can install it globally on your cluster, or you can install multiple copies of, of this operator in different namespaces, as well as um, have it across the namespace. So you can have it separate in a namespace and it will be managing um, another namespace. Um, the operator provides Three APIs. Uh, it's, a, it's listed on the right. So the one that I already mentioned is Web Server Liberty Applications, which is a main uh, API for deploying your uh, applications to the cluster. But it also provides two uh, two day operation um, APIs: the Liberty Dump and Liberty Trace. These two allow you to uh, easily debug your application or uh, enable certain things. So it's hard in a cluster to do that manually because you need to know the details, how to um, set up and execute into the container. You need to know how to set up the storage for the, uh, to take out, uh, take the server dump and, uh, or heap and so on. And basically it will, do that for you. So once you choose this API you created, you can say, uh, do it for me and it will perform those steps for you. So uh, let me show you the Web Server Liberty application. Um, so I'm gonna deploy the first one uh, as an example, which basically shows uh, our licensing service uh, integration. So first thing you need to do is uh, accept the license and choose which entitlement uh, type you have. Uh, so for example, I can choose um, hybrid edition as a, my entitlement source. I'm gonna accept the license, otherwise it will not let me create this application. Uh, this, is, this application comes um, as a sample of getting started it's called uh, it's basically uh, a demo app that you can use uh, to try out the deployment and um, I can also add what a level of resources it has for example I'm going to limit it to using only two CPUs um, and then I'm going to click create and now if I go to the very bottom of this application, um, sorry, um, yeah, sorry, uh, there, um, there we go. And so if you take a look at the status, um, it's already deployed. It's saying the reconciled is true. That means uh, the 
operator process this configuration and applied it as a cluster. It also shows that um, applications uh, resources are ready. So all the necessary resources were created and minimum replicas available. So that means it reached the, the desired state. Uh, so in this case, I asked for one replica for this application and it uh, reached that status. And now I'm gonna show you integration with license service. It's another operator that you can uh, deploy uh, onto your cluster. And what it does, it helps you track the licenses in your cluster. So it shows you what um, licenses you have enabled on your uh, instances of Absurd Liberty and also how much usage that they do actually get. So for example, as you saw before, I chose two CPUs uh, for this application. So it's only using two for this license. And it also has some inf more information about like my nodes. For example, I'm running on this uh, worker node and it actually has a total of eight. So if you didn't specify the limit, it would be using the whole uh, resources from the node. And the more applications you have, the more they will show up in here. And it's this is a keeps track of all the licenses in for different levels of liberty and entitlement. Um, so go, going back to uh, to application. Um, so now uh, I'm going to show you also what resources it creates. So automatically it uh, created a deployment for me. It also created a service and service account. So each application gets its own service account, which means it has its own set of permissions. So you can give access uh, if necessary for each application to access your cluster if it needs to interact with uh, Kubernetes. Also, it um, created network policy. So network policy is something that we added in Web Store Liberty application operator. It's a new feature and um, out of the box, it doesn't pro uh, allow any traffic into your application, um, except for things like uh, metrics. And uh, if you enable external access like um, ingress or route, it will automatically enable that for you. But it, it will generally restrict traffic from any other application coming into this one by default. And you can configure this uh, using um, your YAML uh, snippets. So I can add uh, network policy. I can disable it completely, or I can uh, enable access from applications with certain labels or, or from namespaces with certain labels. And if you have applications that um, have multiple liberty, uh, up, like a kind of like a broad application that contains multiple microservices can, uh, constructed from different liberty applications, you can set application name to that specific application. And as long as they all share the same application name, it will be um, allowed to communicate with each other. All of them will be in the same network. Um, also, uh, the other thing that we added in this release is full end-to-end -end encryption. So if I enable uh, a expose flag, which basically says that this as a application should be available uh, from outside the cluster. So on OpenShift, it will create a route. If you're on any other Kubernetes environment, it will create an ingress. And what it will do, it will actually uh, do full re-encryption um, for SSL. So it will generate 
a certificate for your pods. So each pod will have a certificate and then it will also generate the certificate for the your route. So if I go to um, resources again, so now you actually have a route uh, that was created. And if I go to that, I can access this application. And right now it's running over SSL as well as it going into the pod over SSL. And um, it can either use OpenShift uh, certificate uh, apps already. So OpenShift comes with its own mechanism of generating certificates for services. It also can integrate with uh, Certificate Manager, Cert Manager IO, uh, Certificate uh, API, and generate certificates from there. And um, the, yeah, and the last thing I wanted to show you is that for applications like um, we can create web server library traces or dumps, those uh, basically allow you to specify a specific pod name, specify the trace, and uh, configure other parameters. And once you do that, it will enable the trace within that specific pod. So if you're having issue with one or more pods, you can do those things. And that's a, what we call day two operations. And um, I think that's it for my demo. Um, so I'm going to pass that back to Alistair. Uh, thank you, Arta. Um... Okay. Oh, of course. Uh, I need to skip past these slides. Okay. Um, so um, in the last uh, 10 minutes, uh, I'll kind of talk about the other um, things from uh, uh, that we've delivered in the last uh, quarter. Um, so I always like to include um, this chart, uh, not because I go into it in depth, but because it's available for you when you download the charts to understand the features, what additions they're in, but also um, what has been changing over time. Um, when we when we actually come down to planning capabilities in the Liberty uh, release, uh, we break down the Liberty release into the the following five areas. There are APIs that we um, uh, that we prov that we want to implement to provide application developers with the ability to uh, do the business logic. Um, there's core runtime, which is improvements in how the runtime works. There might be usability improvements. There might be stability improvements. There might be um, there might be performance improvements. Um, uh, and the cloud um, uh, cloud, which is how things operate with in kind of a Kubernetes environment. Uh, but also um, how we do a, you know, things like HA and failover, which could easily be also be a VM-based deployment of Liberty as well. We just kind of lump them together in cloud to just for simplicity, because the considerations are often often the same. Um, we, you know, I, I spoke earlier about you know wanting you know development and productivity being important to us, so we we also have. Uh, a focus area around the developer experience involving, you know, making sure that we have good developer tools, that um, we integrate with the right build um, and, and development tools that developers want to use, but also that we provide good information to developers on how to use Liberty. And then um, uh, finally, um, security and making sure that we are both a secure runtime and also provide the security features that that are needed to uh, run your applications. And if we look at what we did in the last quarter, we actually did uh, a whole bunch of uh, of work across all of these five areas. Sometimes we, you know, we we don't get all five areas, but this time we we did. And 
Uh, quite a, these are relatively minor um, usability improvements. Like in the core runtime, we now have a script for generating a server XML schema. We've always been able to create it. We just didn't expose it as a kind of first class thing. So when people come along and say, hey, how can I know if I've got my server XML correctly? Um, well, we now have a, a tool for generating a um, generating the, a schema that you can use for that. Um, um, but it also includes kind of larger items like the Web Celebrity Operator um, or the um, or Java 18 support. Um, so I'm I'm going to go into a relatively small number um, of of these, um, the ones which I think have a bit more of an impact. Uh, but this is a kind of overview of everything that we we did. So uh, the first thing is uh, Arthur was talking about the Webster Liberty Operator and what the Webster Liberty Operator is about is, you know, how do I run uh, your container inside of OpenShift or inside of a, a Kubernetes um, environment? Because it's not just OpenShift um, uh, that it can be used with. Um, the, the, in order to get to that point, though, you also have to be able to create a container image. And there's a whole bunch of different approaches in the industry to doing this. Um, the, the Probably the most uh, well-known is to use a Docker file. And in the Docker file, you kind of express all of the instructions to create the container image. Um, but this, um, this has a, um, this is kind of a, uh, th this involves you kind of having, in order to get that right, in order to get a good, well-structured um, container image, uh, you need to be able to. Um, uh, you need to be able to understand how container images work and how they're 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 deployed um, uh, in order to get it right. It's very easy to create an, a non-optimized container image for these uh, environments. So. Uh, there are other approaches. Um, um, there are other approaches to doing this. So, for example, there's um, the Red Hat has a project called Source to Image, and the Source to Image um, uh, uh, project um, uh, will effectively create you an image without you having to build a Docker file based on your Maven project. Um, uh, that's a, a kind of Red Hat kind of project. Um, the, one of the alternatives that has kind of come up through the Cloud Native Computing Foundry, Foundation, not Foundry, Foundation, uh, which grew out of the, uh, um, is around the concept of Cloud Native Build Packs. And the idea of a build pack comes from the, uh, a way that um, uh, Cloud Foundry and um, Heroku, uh, I think Heroku is the right, that, that company name, um, did, did went about creating a deployable artifact from an application for their kind of cloud environments. And a cloud native build pack takes the, the idea they had there in order to generate um, a container image instead of the, 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 the old Cloud Foundry Cloud Pack proprietary um, format. Um, that's what a cloud native build pack is. And the Paqueto project is a project to create a tool chain and also a series of build packs for, for effectively doing that. And one of the things that we released in this month, it, this, this quarter is um, a, a Paketo build pack, which you can use in order to um, generate um, a container image. Um, and all you need at that point is to have a, a Maven or a Gradle project and that Paketo build pack is able to kind of build that and create a container image from those artifacts. And you don't need to worry about the, the what should go in the Docker file because um, the Paketo build pack is able to build you the uh, a best practice um, layered uh, Docker image automatically. Um, another thing that we um, we did in um, Liberty is uh, last year we added TLS 1.3 support, but because of some changes in how the JVM decided to implement uh, TLS in uh, in previous versions, uh, a TLS uh, protocol name uh, was commonly interpreted to mean up to and including that version of TLS. So if you configured TLS v 1.2 
um, you would get um, all versions up to 1.2. Um, as those older protocol versions have become um, not secure, um, then they've been progressively disabled through um, Java support releases. So when TLS 1.3 came around, what they decided to do is have uh, the TLS v 1.3 protocol mean just TLS 1.3. And if you wanted to support multiple protocols, you would have to configure um, the, um, the the SSL context that is used to manage in Java the the, the, the TLS conversation. Uh, you would specify both TLS 1.3 and TLS 1.2. Um, but we didn't have a way in in kind of Liberty in order to expose that that configuration. And uh, we've now updated Liberty so where you had an SSL protocol before that took a single um, uh, TLS protocol name, it, it now is able to um, uh, uh, support multiple. Um, so if you want to do 1.3 and, and 1.2, because you have some clients that aren't ready to move up to 1.3 yet, you can absolutely do that with Liberty now. Another thing that we um, work, we worked in Eclipse Link, which is our uh, JPA provider, um, to improve uh, some support for um, bind parameters uh, with DB2. So um, originally Eclipse Link was relatively conservative with how it generated um, uh, SQL for DB2 um, versus um, the uh, JPAQL. I thought I changed this EJBQL statement to BJPAQL, but uh, apparently I managed to miss that. Um, so um, when you use a, a parameter binding, which is where you say in your JPAQL, um, I'm going to provide a value later, and they were combined with um, function uh, calls. Um, it, what Eclipse Sync was doing was saying, well, I, I don't know if DB2's SQL supports that combination, so I'm just going to um, uh, assume it doesn't. And it means that the SQL it would have generated would have had those uh, parameters um, compiled to literals. And what that means is that the, a lot of optimizations that the database can do aren't available, so the SQL runs more slowly. Um, we've gone and updated Eclipse Link to, so Eclipse Link um, now has knowledge of which ones of those operations support this kind of uh, late parameter binding. And that means that um, if you're using those, uh, uh, com those operations which um, support it, in DB2, you're going to get much more efficient um, SQL, which your database is going to be able to um, optimize much more effectively. Um, this is uh, disabled by default. Uh, the reason for this is, uh, you know, this was a specific customer and that was requesting this, and the customer was concerned uh, about potential breaking behavior changes um, due to um, it revealing different uh, uh, bugs in either the database or the JPA engine. Um, so it is off by default, allowing you to kind of enable it, uh, see how the performance works for your application before deciding if you want to enable it um, uh, for real. And uh, with that, I think we're at the end. Um, so we have a, uh, there's a whole bunch of um, guides on Open Liberty IO. Um, actually, I say 55, but that's um, not up to date. Um, so if you want to get hands on with Liberty, uh, going and picking up the Open Liberty guides is an excellent way to do that. Um, I've got a couple of slides in this deck, which we'll share with you for references on um, Liberty. Um, and uh, oh, it's happened again. Uh, last time we did this, when I got to this slide, it wouldn't let me progress beyond. So if you will give me a moment, I will switch to sharing my screen, which does work. Um, so give me a moment. Okay. Hopefully people can see my screen yet. Okay, so um, uh, there's a, we've also got some uh, links to MicroProfile and Jakarta, which is the, the standards-based APIs, as well as some support links. And then finally, we've got kind of information on our, um, I was going to say we've got info documentation on our 
um, uh, uh, Docker images, although one of those links doesn't work. So I don't know how that came about. I will fix that before we um, send out any slides. Um, and before we go on to questions, um, on the last slide, uh, we have a uh, we have a quarterly update um, for uh, 22007 to 9. Um, and it, it, this is the wrong, this is the wrong way round. Um, so it, it's September 15th. Uh, 2022, it will be at one o'clock and it will be for uh, until 2.30. And on the 22nd, it will be at 9, 9 a.m. and it will end at 10.30 a.m. That's when it's scheduled to end. So um, again, I seem to have lost some of the updates I made after the last time to correct those two, but I'll make sure that those uh, two sets of changes are corrected. Um, when I upload the slides um, uh, and we provide them to you. And, uh, oh, um, last thing before we go on to Q&A, we have something called the uh, Cus Webster Customer Advisory Board. And um, if you're interested in um, having an opportunity to uh, hear about things that are being done in Liberty and the rest of the Webster portfolio, uh, as we are working on it before it is released and when you could provide some feedback on, on, on what we're doing that might change what we're doing. Um, the cab is a great place to do it. There is a non-disclosure agreement. Um, although there are weekly meetings, um, you don't have to come to every meeting. You can choose which meetings you would like to come to based on whether or not the, the agenda sounds like it's of, of use and of interest to you. Uh, but it is something that you can absolutely kind of sign up to uh, to join. And uh, with that, we can move on to the questions uh, section. Uh, Lars? Yep, I'm back. Thanks a lot for the presentation to you, Alistair and uh, Arthur. So we have several questions. The first ones are around the WebSail Liberty operator. So first question, uh, there's no operator for WebSail Liberty as well as for Open Liberty. Can I use the WebSail Liberty operator also for Open Liberty if I want to cover the entitlement, entitlement via the WAS entitlement? Uh, yes. Yes. So if you, our recommendation would be if you're using Open Liberty and you want support via your WebSphere entitlement, you should use the WebSphere Liberty operator because it will get all of the, it will set up the licensing uh, correctly with the license service. Um, you can do that with the Open Liberty operator. It's just it's a lot more involved to get it right. Um, so um, I would definitely recommend using the Webster Liberty operator over the Open Liberty operator in that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So another question about the Liberty operator in the demo, uh, the the Webster Liberty operator only exposed the SSL port nine four four three. Can I also expose only port nine three eighty? Uh, yes, so you can uh, either expose both ports. It's possible you have uh, you have one default one which is used for everything, and you can add additional ports through service um, dot ports spec dot service dot ports configuration. So you can have two ports, um, or you can just change the default port to ninety eighty and disable. Uh, management of the TLS. So the managed TLS flag to, can be set to false. So if you're doing some development work and you want to test without SSL, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So next question is around uh, Java 17, Jakarta EE9. Uh, if I use Java 17, do I need to use Jakarta EE9 over time or could I stick with uh, Java 17 in combination with Java EE8? Uh, well, if you're if you want to use Java, so, sorry, let me sure make sure I got this right. Are you asking if you can uh, run Java SE seventeen when you're using the Java EE eight features? Correct. Yes, you absolutely can do that. Um, uh, we 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 when we um, add support for newer versions of Java SE, we are testing the 
um, the, the the earlier um, features against the newer JVMs. It's not necessarily the case that you can do the opposite. So um, I, I'd need to check what the E9, um, uh, what we did for E9 compatibility. Um, but um, you can, um, uh, you, you know, you, so Carter E9, if it, it might prereq 11, for example, at which point we would support eight for others, but not for nine. But I've just checked. Um, Jakarta E9 even supports Java SE8. So, uh, yeah, at the moment, any version of Jakarta E with, or Java E with any version of Java SE is fine. And, and there's no plan that after a year or so, uh, the combination will go away, right? Uh, we don't have a plan to disable um, Java EE8 support on Java SE17. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, we have published end of uh, support dates for Java 11 and Java um, 8 because those are when Java 11 and 8 is end of life in the kind of industry is well known now. Um, so we've publicized to say what that means for Liberty. Um, but that's kind of the opposite way around from what you were, you're, you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of my customers now go to Java 17 because they know about Java 11. It's not that long supported. Yeah, so Java 11 um, end of supports uh, currently slated for 2024, which is um, only two years away. Um, uh, that That's kind of, uh, a lot of people still find that difficult to get their head around because Java SE8 um, end of support is after then. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would say if you're planning to go into production now, you should be doing um, 17 and not 11 for sure. Mm -hmm. So next question is about a bit about compliance. I have a Liberty core entitlement and want to use a Liber Liberty kernel image. How can I make sure that I do not build the contain container image with features that are not part of Liberty core when adding the server that is mapped? Yeah, so um, the simplest uh, the simplest solution to absolutely kind of foolproof make sure that you don't accidentally do this is um, on Fix Central and in Passport Advantage, we have a license jar for Liberty Core that you can apply to the um, Liberty image for kernel image from uh, IBM Container Registry. And if the first thing you do in your uh, Docker file is add that and then install it, um, that will uh, then any attempt to install a feature from the Liberty repository that is not entitled through Liberty Core will result in an error. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I know uh, from a, <laughs> interestingly, I know from a conversation with um, uh, Lars that uh, the error message that you get when a image a, a feature can't be installed if you're using the configure.sh script, uh, which we document as the best practice for getting the features, uh, ensuring the features are installed. Um, I think it's like an error code 21 or 25, which isn't very descriptive, um, but it will cause the um, doc the container build to fail at that point. So that that's kind of the simplest way to make sure that. The, that that's that that's uh, that 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 that's can't you can't get into trouble on on accidentally using a, a feature not entitled to Liberty Core. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So next question is about Java 11. So in Java 11, the local connector seems only to work with the JDK and not with the JRE. Uh, which yes. other options do I have to uh, do a uh, to, to connect to the uh, JMX? Uh, do a do a connect uh, do a JMX connection to Liberty. Sorry, are you asking how to connect to uh, JMX if you're not using local, if local connect is not an option? If I, use, if I want to use a JRE only in Liberty, yeah. I want to connect uh, via JMX. Then you'd need to use the REST connector. Mm -hmm. uh, the okay. reason for this, the reason for this is that in between Java 8 and Java 11, uh, uh, the Java 
distribution decided to move some function that used to be in the JRE into the SDK. So it's no longer available. And that was what local connector relies on in order for that connector to work. And this will also not change with Java 17, correct? So the recommendation will always be to go to uh, the rest of the connector. Mm -hmm. Correct. So the next question is about a web server plugin. So the web server plugin uh, generates automatically, uh, is generated automatically when the server starts. It can also be generated by MBIN, for example, but for yes. all the options, the server has to be started. Is there any option to generate the plugin without having the Liberty server started? No. No, and that's because um, until the server is started, we don't know what um applications um have been deployed to the um server and also i think the very variable uh, resolution is not there correct very yeah 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 so i mean this is a this is a uh because of the way that liberty configuration works um a lot of uh, uh it's 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 you effectively need you know you effectively if you want to understand everything that the server understands uh, you need to start the server uh, because you need the context to, you know, not just the server configuration, but you need to know where all the server configuration comes from and have the context around it. So if you, um, uh, if you, if you want to be sure that you've got the right applications and you've probably been processing the applications correctly based on what's there and all the configuration, you kind of need to start the server. Um, and that's that's a bit of a, a heavyweight kind of uh, operation. But if we wanted to do it offline, what we would end up having to do is effectively start the server in, um, during a, a, a generation. And we just, it, it, that's just, it seems like, well, in that case, you might as well just start the server. Um, um, and it generates you the, um, the plugin XML, and then you can move it to wherever it needs to be to, to get that configuration working. Um, if, if you want something that works better than that, there's a feature in um, Liberty ND, which is called dynamic routing, and that allows you to um, connect your uh, Liberty servers to a collective controller and then have the web server plugin talk to the collective controller about the status of the applications. And then just by dint of starting a server that's part of the collective, um, the routing from uh, the web server will automatically function. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So next is also about the web server plugin. I want to use Nginx in front of my Liberty instances for a simple workload management and failover. Do I need to use installation manager with the web server plugin? No. In that case, um, in that case, there, there isn't a plugin for um, Nginx. Uh, there was, uh, there is somewhere, and I'm sorry, I don't have it to hand some documentation on how you would configure this uh, Nginx to do the forwarding. Uh, but you don't need the, you, the the plugin isn't used in that situation. It's just um, information on how to configure Nginx to make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And another question about the web server. So I currently use um, my HTTP server in front of a was and cell for SSL termination and uh, authentication. If I now move my TWAS in containers and OpenShift, uh, what uh, would I do with my HTTP server? So that I still do, can do some termination. Would so, I put it uh, on OpenShift or wherever would it put it? Yeah, so we don't tend to recommend people run um, IBM HTTP server in that situation. Uh, we tend to recommend people uh, rely on OpenShift or the Kubernetes platform to manage uh, manage that termination. Mm -hmm. Or oh, otherwise, I would put the HTTP server in front of the OpenShift cluster, correct? Uh, you can do that as well. It, we don't tend to see people doing that so much. Um, uh, OpenShift is capable of doing the TLS termination, so that tends to be the most uh, common uh, set up. There are a small number of people who've decided to put IBM HTTP server in uh, to it, but uh, there are some restrictions in order to kind of make it work sensibly. Um, uh, I can't remember all of what those are, but I uh, are, are, but they were they were in the IHS documentation. 
um, but generally we advise against it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the last question about HTTP server, uh, how does the plugin merge tool work? So how does it identify if I have more, multiple Liberty instances, uh, which, uh, which uh, should be in the same cluster and which would be different application servers? Is there anything like a clone idea or something that will be used or? Um, I, I, I don't know. It's been a, a long time since I looked at the merge tool. Um, I, I, so sorry. Um, I, I just don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we will take a look it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if we have additional questions. I feel like that might be the first time you, you've ever given me a question, Lars, that I actually don't know the answer to. <laughs> yeah, maybe the technology is too old. <laughs> I probably knew I probably knew the answer at one point as well. I just um, it's been it's been a while since I got questions about it. Okay. So yeah. So are there any further questions from the audience? I cannot see anything at the moment. So the other question that I saw was uh, about this uh, server.xml uh, check tool, what you uh, mentioned to, uh, today. So what exactly does it verify? That the syntax is correct or also uh, regarding licensing or other stuff? Does it also include uh, the includes and all this stuff or how does it work? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure which tool you're talking about. Yeah, in one of the slides you talked about uh, something to check uh, how the the server that it's mail regarding syntax. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I, it, it's just a schema for the server XML format. So you can run anything that val does schema validation across the XML against that uh, schema. It's not a tool per se. It, it, it's just a mechanism to get a schema to use a schema validator tool. And they could also adjust the schema so that, for example, would not allow some uh, features or some... Uh, Capabilities of Libet, or sure. If you if you if you want to um, do that, but you'd need to edit yourself the schema. We we don't have anything in the tool that would say uh, don't include this piece of configuration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So let us. So are there any further questions? It appears that we're out of questions. Yeah, seems so. Yep. So it seems there are no further questions at the moment. I think uh, then we can close. So, so thanks a lot, uh, Alistair and Arthur, for your presentation and uh, details. So it was really interesting, especially the new uh, Web Liberty operator, something that really is uh, configuration of uh, Liberty regarding licensing, all this kind of stuff. And uh, I will be keen to test it. <laughs> so thanks a lot. And thanks a lot also to the audience for staying with us. Uh, I hope you, you have some further questions uh, that you can then put into our channels. Otherwise, I hope you will also see you back uh, in September when we have our next sessions.